This entire month, we've been in a series, and we're calling it Unfiltered, and myself and our teaching team have endeavored to take a transparent look at a number of questions, unfiltered questions. What I mean by that is, is by and large, we're drawing from the Psalms, we're drawing from different places in Scripture where they just, they just don't mince words. It's just pretty clear, and it is, um, it is a series of questions that I think we're asking. And if we're not, if you're not asking these questions, hopefully by just kind of implanting them into your spirit, you're getting them to roll around inside of you and go, you know what, I should be asking these questions more and more and more. Over the last few weeks, we've asked such questions as, why does the Christian life seem so difficult? Why does Christian life seem so difficult? Secondly, what does it mean to fully surrender to the Lord? What's that really look like? All right, and thirdly, um, we talked about how to partner with Jesus in the miraculous. Like, if, if the Bible really does say greater things we're gonna do because he leaves and goes to the Father, what, is, what are those greater things? What does that look like? How do we partner with the Lord in the miraculous? And then uh, last week, what we did was we unpacked the question of, of the things that, that kind of consistently rob us of our joy. What are those things that consistently can just deflate us, that can rob us of joy and passion in Jesus? Okay? Now today, here we go. Today, in order to, to ask the question and fully answer the question that I want to bring to you in maybe five or six minutes, I have to just tell you what I'm going to talk about. And it's a big subject. It's a big, tough subject. Okay? For the next few moments, what I need to do with you is talk to you about death. I need to talk to you about death in order to get to this question. Now, some of you are uncomfortable with death. Okay? Some of you may have faced death recently in a, lo a loved one, perhaps, or uh, someone close to you. Um, others of you may be facing something physically that is bringing you near to death. Okay? Some of you may struggle with this conversation because you want to just kind of deny it. You want to kind of bury your head and say this doesn't exist. But, but I need to tell you flat out, I'm not nervous talking to you about death. I know it's my job. I know it's my calling. I know it's my purpose. As a pastor, as a shepherd of people, my job is to prepare you to die. Now, I'm not just talking about your funeral. I'm not talking about the preparations, the service, and the wonderful time, the songs that will be sung, and who will share uh, from the platform, and is an open cast or closed. I'm not talking about those kind of details. We do help in those areas as well. But I'm talking about something way bigger. I'm talking about the life that you live. And I'm talking about the eternity that you're going to spend. Okay, my job is to prepare you to die. This reminds me of kind of a cute story about a mom and a dad that took their seven-year-old boy. Uh, I need to tell you a cute story because you're just, you seem really somber in here right now. Okay, okay. Mom and dad took a seven-year-old boy to a patriotic funeral. I don't know if you've ever been to one of those with the, the gun salute and the flag presentation. It's pretty, pretty powerful. But they took this little boy to this uh, service because they wanted him to experience what that's like, and they wanted him to, to bring honor where honor is due and to, and to respect uh, those that serve in our military. They didn't even know the family. They kind of just snuck in and spent time there just to experience this, this moment. And during this service, the little boy, seven-year-olds, leaned over to mom and asked the question, who, who died? Who died? And said it kind of loud, you know? And mom kind of hushed him, shh, quiet. And she said very quietly, it was a man in the service. And he looked back at her. And this is a kid that kind of goes to church. He goes to Sunday school. And he looked back kind of quizzically and says, which service? First service or second service? He just said it out loud. First or second? Now, as a joke, it's just a cute little story, and, and, and here we are in what, second service? You know, on Sunday, we have a 9.30, we have 11.15. What some of you may not realize is we actually have a 6 p.m. on Saturday night as well. But let me use this as a, a little uh, FYI. If you weren't here last week, last week we announced that we're shifting our services, okay? And we're shifting them on, incidentally, Memorial Weekend, okay? Memorial Weekend, we're shifting services off of Saturday solely on to Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.30. And I, I had to tell last night's service this, and I'll just say it to you in case for some reason coming at 11.30 is really more difficult than coming at 11.15 like you did. Most people come in at 11.30 anyways, right? Right? Okay. 
But I just want you to know, no one's going to die in this process, okay? Change is good for a church, right? We change often. We'll, we'll do this for a while. We'll try different things. And this is just an important part of being disciples of Jesus Christ, learning how to adapt and learning how to move with what the Lord is doing. And I think we're in a season where it's really valuable for us to move together and to really interact. As a matter of fact, the length of the services, the time in between is going to afford us to really kind of to do what I said uh, about three or four months ago, to do uh, what's called the Google bump. It's that kind of thing where we move stuff into proximity like Google has done, where they move the tables closer in the cafeteria so people bump into each other and they can interact with one another. So for us to be able to gather and lobby and cross paths with other people is really really important. So that's happening and no one's going to die. All right, believe me, we're going to make it through it. All right. So let's go back to talking about death. Here we go. (laughs) Friends, barring the return of Jesus in our lifetime, um, all of us are going to die. We're all going to die. Last time I checked, the death rate is still 100%. Right? Think about it. Some of you are like, wait, what does that mean? Yes, 100% of us are going to die, barring the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, There's a comedian, Stephen Wright. He he said this, and I love this. It makes me laugh every time he says it. He says, I intend to live forever. And so far, so good. (laughs) So far, so good, right? I mean, until I die, I'm going to live forever. I'm just going to keep going. And a lot of us, we think that, that, you know, we we put that into our mentality. We're like, I'm going to live forever. And we're not just talking about young people. We're talking about every age. Somehow we think we're invincible. Somehow we think we're going to get past it. But friends, we can't deny it. We can't defer it. We can't denounce it. We are simply going to succumb to it. We're going to die. You can't deny death. All right? Our days are numbered. Ecclesiastes uh, says this. There's an appointed time to live, and there's an appointed time, fill in the blank, to what? Die. To die. A lot of us try to get around this. We try to avoid it, but we can't. We can't. Someone once said this, if you live each day as if it were your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid, but what I want to be is motivational today. I want to motivate you to look at your life. Again, my job is to prepare you to die. It's your job to live accordingly. It's your job to live accordingly. It's my job to prepare you to disciple. The Bible says this in Ephesians. Is it's the work of the pastors to equip the church, to equip the church. But it's your job to live out your faith. I can't do that for you. The person sitting next to you can't do that for you. Your family members can't. Your friends can't. You have to decide how you're going to live. And that requires us to, to reverse engineer. Some of you are familiar with that, that, that concept. To reverse engineer means you take the end, the goal, and then you work your way backwards, right? You know what you're aiming for. And for us to be talking about death right now will give us a picture of what we're aiming for. And it helps us ask the right questions leading up to that. If we all know we're going to die, then we better start thinking through how we're living right now. And that brings me to the question, you may want to write this down, the question that we're going to work on this morning. The question is this, how do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? I think this is going to help us reverse engineer this. If we're talking about death, and if ultimately every one of us, 100% of us will die, okay, barring the return of Jesus, but the Bible says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if Jesus comes back, that's all good, okay? But barring the return of Jesus Christ, if we all know we're going to die, then let's ask ourselves the question, how do we want to be remembered? If you could eavesdrop, this is going to be creepy for a second, if you could eavesdrop on your own funeral, what would you want to hear? Creepy, huh? But have you ever thought about that? Let's be really honest. Raise your hand if you've ever thought about wanting to eavesdrop in your own funeral. Okay, and then after a few moments of thinking about that, did it kind of weird you out enough where you're like, no, I don't want to know. I just don't. What, what would happen if it got ugly? What would happen if they said horrible things? What would happen if they opened up the floor for people to talk and no one said a word? They were ambivalent. I can remember my very first funeral. I was 22 years old, very first funeral that I ever performed, okay? As a 22-year-old, I got asked to perform a funeral in a bar, it was a bar. 
And I showed up at this address, and I was confused because I was like, this is the address. There's no church here. Well, it's a church for some people, I guess. But uh, I walked in. It smelled. I was like, oh, heavens. And there was a few people sporadically throughout the room. And they're, hey, preacher, come on over. And they asked me if I wanted something to drink. The bar was open at the time. I said, no, I'm, I'm actually okay, um, barely legal. And, uh, and uh, we gathered with about 25 to 30 people in the kind of open seating area. And I made the grand mistake of opening up the floor for people to share about the brother that had passed away. At 22 years old, I, I don't know how I navigated it. But people just began to stand up and say things that were so vile, so out of line, so horrible. Relatives, parents, friends, all declaring what a rotten man this guy was. And there I stood. Finally, I was able to resurrect it and bring it back, and we celebrated something. I barely knew the guy was asked. I didn't, even, I didn't know the guy, sorry. I didn't know him at all. I was able to say some things about what he could have been, the hope of who he could have been. <laughs> Friends, in that place, if you think about eavesdropping in on your own funeral, what do you want people to say about you? I asked that question around town. This last week, I did a little man on the street kind of impromptu survey with people in various locations, grocery stores, coffee shops. I'd walk up to people and say, hi, can I ask you a question? Sure. And I said, I'd like to ask you how you'd like to be remembered when you die. Instantly, I think people, many of them were fearful for their own lives at that point, <laughs> right? <laughs> I had to smile while I was saying it just to make sure they understood I wasn't a weirdo. And, and, uh, and they, many of them stopped and thought, and I, I was able to capture a handful of their responses. I didn't get everyone. This is not a, a, a exhaustive. This is not certainly representative of every person in the Willamette Valley. But I asked that question to a guy named Russ, and he said this. He said, I'd like to be known as a provider, as caring. And he says, I hope my kids say I'm a good father. I asked Jeff, he says, I want people to say that I'm loving, I'm kind, and I'm fair. I walked across the street, and I found a gal named Jamie. And Jamie says, I want to be known as kind and nice. She went on to give me this quote. She says, you know what? You can't go wrong with being known as nice. You really can't. I asked a gal named Debbie, and she could only get out one word. She said, friendly. And then she began to cry. And she says, you're making me cry. And she didn't go on to describe why she was crying. It could have been something that emotively caught her. Maybe she was thinking about her kids or what her husband would say. Maybe there's something going on between the two of them. Maybe she was fearful of a relationship that was broken with her sisters that would come back to haunt her at her funeral. I don't know. I don't know. But all she could get out was friendly. Many of you are familiar with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, who died, gave a commencement speech at Stanford University. It was entitled, How to Live Before You Die. In it, it was a long speech, but he said this, and I just want to give you an excerpt. He said, death is a journey we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment, all failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. These are wise words from a brilliant, brilliant man. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you he was a practicing Buddhist. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't tell you he grew up as a Lutheran. And I've never met him, although I use every one of his products that he created. He has changed my life, and I'm forever grateful. <laughs> I've never met him. I've never had a conversation with him. I don't know where he's spending eternity. Only God knows. I don't know what kind of decisions he made upon his deathbed. But here's what I do know. God has an appointed time for each of us. How you live now determines how I believe you're going to be remembered then. How you live now 
is how you're going to be remembered then. It was William Wallace, Braveheart, right? How many Braveheart fans in the room, right? Here's what he said. He said, all men die, not all men truly live. It's like, I want to run around this room on a horse with my face painted just to yell that out to you. I want you to get that. All people die, but not everyone lives. Truly. And friends, my job is to prepare you to die. And ultimately, in preparing you to die, it prepares you to actually live. To really live. The true kind of living. Not the fake kind of living. I want to be people, I want to be a person that truly lives. And is completely prepared to die. This is how we're going to be remembered, I think. David, we remember him, and he wrote in a number of the Psalms, and I want to look at one together. It's Psalm 39, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to it. Psalm 39, it's as if we're going to look at kind of the scrapbooks of David or the journals of David. If you've ever had a loved one die and you've been able to go back and look at photo albums, the Psalms really are like that for David. You just flip the pages. And you're seeing the good, the bad, the ugly. You're seeing the hurts and the pains. You're seeing the joys. You're seeing his victories. You're seeing his failures. It's all being described or sung out in the Psalms. And I want us to look at Psalm 39, and I want us to capture something of of the tone in which he's speaking, because these Psalms were intended to be set to music. If you look at the heading at the very top, it says, for the director of music, a Psalm of David. A Psalm is really a song. It's as if he wrote a piece of poetry and then gave it to the musician and says, here's what I'm feeling like any one of you would ever uh, write a piece of poetry to be set to music. You'd say, here's the tone, here's the feel. And I can picture David handing this guy whose name is Jedithun. I can imagine him handing Jedithun this piece of music saying, here's what I feel for this one. I feel like it's it's gotta be um, kind of a little bit melancholy, reflective, I would, I would encourage you musicians to perhaps play it with a lot of breath, a lot of air. Give it some pauses. We're going to talk about pauses in just a second. Make sure there's a stand-up bass in there somewhere and a cello, just something like that. I can picture that. Why? Because the way David writes is he writes with um, reflection. He's very, very pensive. Let's pick it up in verse 4. The Bible says, show me, Lord, my life's end. And show me the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You've made my days a mere hand breath. In other words, like the distance of your hand. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Now, in your scripture, it's possible that whatever version you're using, it has this word, and it's a word that if it isn't found right there in the text, it's at least referenced down to the footnote of your Bible, and it's the word selah, S-E-L-A-H. Selah is a word that we don't know the meaning of. No one knows the meaning of it. No one. Smart people don't know the meaning of it. But what we have concluded is that it's possible, it was a music notation, that it's possible selah means to pause. It's possible it means take a breath. In other words, someone was adding in some verses and then allowing for space for the music to continue to play before they went into the next verse. And I wonder if we could do this. I wonder if we could look at it again and then we could just say la. We could just think on it. We could stop. We could ponder our days. Let's look at this. It says, show me, Lord, my life's end. Imagine if the Lord showed you when this was going to be over for you. Thank God he doesn't, by the way, right? And think about the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. By the way, that's something we can know. We're not going to know the days. We're not going to know when it's going to end, but we can determine just how fleeting this life really is. You've made my days just like the width of my hand. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Selah. Think about it. Ponder your days. Think about how short it is. Some of you are thinking of parents that passed away early or friends that got in a car accident or you're thinking about your own medical history and you're thinking about little ones that have gone home to be with Jesus long before they ever should have. 
just how short this life is. Even those that seem secure, even those that think they have it just by the tail, every one of those that think that they've got all of this figured out, that they're invincible, that they're never going to die, this life is but a breath. Let's read on into verse 6. Verse 6 says, Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about and they heap up wealth without even knowing whose it will finally be. You see, you could try to fight this. You could try to run around. You could try to accumulate as much as you can before you die. You could just think that activity is your answer. You could try to get better promotions. You could try to reach the top in your corporation. You could move around all over the country to get better jobs. You could leave your spouses to get better spouses. You will try and try and try, and you don't even know who it's going to finally be. It reminds me of what Jamie said, this gal that I interviewed on the street. It was actually in a, a, a store when I finally had this conversation with her. She said this. She says, I don't know anyone who would ever say, man, I wish I would have worked more. She says, I don't know anyone that would say that. If, if, if you were to ask me about my final days, if you were to ask me what people were going to say about me when I die, if you were going to ask me about the end of all time, I don't think anyone would ever say, boy, I wish I would have worked more. And she went on to say, if you find anyone that says that, then have them come take over my shift at Roth's. <laughs> you know, David, the psalmist, is basically saying, I don't care who you are, you're going to die. And he goes on to say, I don't care how much you accumulate, you can't take it with you. The old adage is true. You never see a U-Haul in a funeral procession. You can't take your stuff with you. You can't store it up. You can't collect it in a place where it becomes yours in the afterlife. That's not the case. What we have to be remembered for is something far beyond our wealth, far beyond our possessions, far beyond the, the, the hours that we spent working and working and working. That's not what we're to be known for question you have to answer is, how do you want to be remembered? Each of us basically decides by the decisions we make right now. Right now. Moses prayed this in Psalm 90, it's verse 12. He says, Lord, teach me to number my days that I might gain a heart of wisdom. Teach me to number my days. Wisdom comes when you look at the end of your life. And you may say, this is so morbid. No, it's not. It's motivational. I want to move you from the place, perhaps, of apathy in your own life where you just think this can just kind of unfold naturally. Life doesn't just unfold. It happens through decisions that you and I make. What kind of decisions are you making to produce the end result of someone standing at your funeral and saying the kind of things that you would like to hear them say? I'm not talking about time management now. I'm not talking about wisdom just to manage your particular day. We're pretty good at managing the 24 hours in our day. By and large, we have tools, we've got phones, we've got day timers. I get buzzes on my wrist for every appointment that's coming up. We are great, by and large, at managing the day, the hours within our day. Here's what we're horrible at, by and large, is managing the number of days within the light of eternity. How are we living in the light of eternity? That's what we should be looking for. That's what we gotta be setting our gaze towards. I I, I love what David asked here. It's a question out of verse seven. Look at this. But now, Lord, what do I look for? Based upon all of this, based upon the fact that life is short, that life is fleeting, what do I look for? What do I look for? And don't don't you love it when you read David? He asks all these rhetorical questions all the time. He asks, asks a question, and then he answers his own question. He says, what do I look for? Oh yeah, my hope is in you. My hope is in you, Lord. Friends, make sure you catch my eyes here for a second. I want to make sure I'm seeing all of you. Invest your life in God. Invest your hope in God. It's the only thing that lasts, please. And if you do that, I can make you a fairly certain promise that if you will invest your hope and your life in the Lord, you will have a legacy. 
The temporal things, they don't matter. The kind of, the jobs, this, I'm, not, I'm not saying you shouldn't work. I'm not saying you shouldn't be active. The Bible speaks to those things and it puts it in value and in importance. But if that becomes your end all be all, if you are thinking that just because you're providing a home or in, um, uh, the livelihood for your kids and you don't present anything of a spiritual quality to your children, friends, that's not enough. Invest your life in God. Put your hope in God. And I believe there's some things they'll say about you. And I want to put it into first person for me because as I've thought about this week and as I've prayed through what I wanted to talk to you about, I've just put myself in the spot as a transparent glimpse into my own life. I've thought, what would I want people to say? Perhaps even in this building. Should I go home to be with the Lord? Someone else from our team or good friends of mine will stand up here, whether it's an open cast or a close or no, I don't know. I just know there's going to be people that will say things about me. And I want to tell you what I've determined I would like people to say about me. You may want to take notes because I may call on some of you to actually speak at my own funeral. Okay. Here's what I would say. And you can eavesdrop in. You may want to take these three things and say, I I want those for myself. Here they are. The first thing I want people to say is, that guy feared the Lord. That guy feared the Lord. Could you say that of yourself? Would you want to hear those phrases? He or she feared the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and I think the fear of of God is the beginning and the end to everything. And when I talk about fear, I'm talking about a deep and a devout esteem for the Lord. I'd put it this way, and it seems trite to say it this way, but it really is, and I I just want to always take God very, very seriously. And you know the flip side of that, right? Is that we take ourselves not so seriously. And I would hope that that's what you'd say about me. And go, that guy never took himself too seriously, but he sure took God seriously. So the fear of God is the first. The second thing I would want someone to say about me, maybe you'd want the same, is that guy was a friend of God. He was a friend of God. It was spoken of this uh, uh, regarding Abraham. It's in James chapter two. We just read this in our pause reading plan. James 2.23 says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then it finishes by saying, and he was called God's friend. Imagine having that spoken of you. Not only that you would have faith like Abraham, not only that you'd be righteous like Abraham, but that would reduce it all down to something so intimate and so powerful to say, and that guy, that gal, was a friend of God. It was a friend of God. And the last thing I would want someone to say about me, and I would want this for you as well, is that they would say of us, he or she was a pursuer of God, a pursuer of God, that you would just go after God with your whole heart. That's what they spoke of David. In Acts chapter 13 and in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. David was a man after God's own heart. Can that be said of you? Like David, we're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. David committed an affair. He, 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 was, he had a man killed. He murdered someone. So it wasn't that he was sinless, but he was someone who pursued God. He pursued God. I wonder if that can be said of us. With that, I want us to pray, and uh, I want us to commit ourselves to these things. Jason, why don't you come, and we'll finish together. Just close your Bibles, if you would, and close your eyes with me, and I want us to pray. All the temporal stuff that we've, we could pursue is really nothing compared to being known as a person who fears God, is a friend of God, and a pursuer of God. And if you're finding yourself short in any of those areas, if you're saying, man, that, that doesn't describe me, that doesn't describe me, then there's no condemnation, but there is motivation. Motivation. Friend, I would say to you, as if I was sitting right next to you in a coffee shop, I would look across the table and if you could just picture that happening right now, even though there's a a bunch of people in this room, if we could just picture ourselves talking openly and honestly one to another, I would ask you, how do you want to be remembered? Reverse engineer it. 
I would speak even more bluntly to some of you today. I would say, if you are wanting to have an outcome and yet your life is not leading towards that outcome, then you are deceiving yourself. You're deceiving yourself. Do not be deceived. Be known as a person who fears God, who is a friend of God, who is a pursuer of God. And engineer your life that direction with grace that comes from God himself. And so let's pray. Lord, help us in that. Help us to be those kind of people. Lord, we want to invest our life in you. We want to invest our life and our hope in you. And we want to be remembered for something that's way more lasting. It's not temporal. It doesn't just gain us a quick fix. It doesn't just gain us something here upon this earth, but it gains us a legacy. We're asking for that legacy. And we're asking you, Lord, to to move amongst us right now in our hearts because we're the kind of people that don't do well at sticking with these kind of commitments, Lord. As we say we want to fear you, we want to be a friend of you, we want to pursue you, we can believe that in this room, but a lot of times we walk out, we don't live that out. And so, God, help us. In church, in just a moment, I've asked Jason to lead us in this song. It's an old hymn. It's something that's ancient, and I felt like we just needed to to anchor ourselves to something old, something that's been around, not something fluffy and light. But in this song, it just declares, it says, we're prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. We're prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. I want to invite you to sing that with me. Let's stand together and let's just sing this song and let's commit ourselves to allow the fountain of the Lord to wash over us.